liberty and the free will there God is ever found brought near together by Christ's love by love are we thus found with grateful joy and holy Charity we learn. Let us with heart and mind and soul now love him in return. Forgive we now each other's faults as we our faults confess. And let us love each other well in Christian holy. is holy peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Out of the depths, I, I cry, cry to you, O Lord. Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a call ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people in the courts of the house of the Lord, in the midst of Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23-32. through 32. For I received from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, 
you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had finished their feet, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Jesus, greatest at the table, the Almighty Son of Man, laid aside his outer clothing, poured some water in a pan. As the twelve lay hushed in silence, he the servant as Marvel how their Lord and teacher 
gently taught them not to fight. As he humbly knelt before them, dusty feet to wash and dry, by his tender touch expressing true compassion from on high. Jesus took the role of servant when upon that gruesome span for all human sin he suffered as a vile and loathsome man on the cross poured out like water to fulfill the Father's plan. Can we fathom such deep mercy? Do we see what God has done? Who can grasp this great reversal? Love that gives his only Son, Christ the sinless, for the sinners, for the many dies the one. Jesus gave to his disciples a commandment that was new. Show my love to one another, do as I have done for you. All the world will know you love me as you love each other. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for the sermon on this Monday, Thursday, is the Holy Gospel from St. John, the 13th chapter. I can read once again verses 5 through 9. Then Jesus poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So far the word of the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there's an old saying, cleanliness is next to godliness. For many of us who are of German or Scandinavian heritage, I think we can probably identify with that saying. I've never traveled to mainland Europe, but I understand that in Germany and some of the Scandinavian countries and other countries in Europe, they actually wash the exterior of their house uh, once a week, and they wash down their sidewalks almost every day. Many of us grew up with our moms uh, uh, insisting, make sure you wash your hands before you come to dinner. That still rings in the back of my mind. Lately, we've been doing a lot of hand washing, haven't we? To combat, to mitigate against this coronavirus. Wash, 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 and more washing of hands. Washing to the point where your hands are probably dried or chapped, it's hard to keep them moistened. But I think with all the hand washing that's happening these days, at least we can become more understanding of God's Old Testament people, the children of Israel, who had all kinds of washings and, and ceremonial rites to, to, to finish and conclude. They had sanitary washings just for practical reasons, but especially for the ceremonial washings related to their faith. There was clean foods and unclean foods. You could eat fish with fins and scales, but no shellfish. If you had an infectious disease like leprosy, uh, if you were cured, you had to go show yourself to the priests, 
And then after they declared you clean, you had to go through a ceremonial washing in order for you to go back out into public. If you had uh, clothing with mildew, you not only had to wash the clothing, but you yourself then would have to be uh, washed to be ceremonial clean. Even in Jesus' day, uh, remember his first miracle at Cana and Galilee when he changed the water into wine? Uh, there were six stone water jars and they were there for uh, ceremonial washings. And so the people were very familiar with washing. The scribes and Pharisees more than once accused Jesus and his disciples of not washing their hands before they ate. And of course, in the Old Testament scriptures, really there's, there's no command to wash hands specifically other than one day of the year, and that was Passover. On Passover, the head of the household, usually the father, uh, would take a basin with water and a towel, and he would go around and wash the hands of each member of his family. On the night before his crucifixion, Jesus told his disciples, I have longed to eat this Passover meal with you. Jesus shared that Passover meal with his disciples. And I find it rather striking that in the middle of the meal, and probably even before it started, you know what the disciples were arguing about? They were arguing about who was the greatest among them. This very night, when Jesus would be betrayed, they were arguing about who was great. Arguments happen in our lives. We, brothers and sisters, argue. Spouses argue. But it's especially annoying when it happens at the dinner table, isn't it? You're hoping to tell about the events of the day or share something that's happened that's nice, and it ends up being an argument. And really, that's what the disciples were doing here on Passover, the night that Jesus longed to, to have that special meal with them. And as they were arguing, Jesus got up from the table. He took out, off his outer cloak, got a basin, filled it with water, and he went around the, 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 the table washing their feet. What a scandal. How did that strike the disciples? Washing feet was left to the lowest of the low servants. They were the ones that washed people's feet. But Jesus here took this water and this towel and washed their feet, and they were shocked. They were scandalized. He, their rabbi, their master, yes, even the Lord, Peter had just confessed him as the Son of God, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And now here we find God doing grunt work. It almost sounds blasphemous to say it. The very God who created Adam from the dust of the ground is now washing dust off the feet of the disciples. How much lower could one go? But why? Why was Jesus washing their feet? This was a defining moment, if you will, for Jesus and his disciples. After he had finished washing their feet, Jesus himself explains why he was doing it. These words he spoke, when Jesus had finished their feet and put on the outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Jesus was the suffering servant. He fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. Surely he has borne our griefs, he's carried our sorrows. He was stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He came as our servant, the suffering, self-sacrificing, substitutionary Savior who came to serve us, yes, even to the point of death. The Apostle Paul caught the humiliation of our Lord, him coming as a servant in last Sunday's Gospel, the Gospel for Palm Sunday. Have this attitude in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, and he humbled himself, yes, even to the point of death on a cross. Indeed, the very next day, Jesus, the humble foot washer, would climb Mount Calvary, 
And there he would give his life as that substitutionary death for you and me. Dying in our place, dying the death you and I deserve because of our sins, Jesus hung there on that center cross. There was another hand washing, however, that happened the very next morning, on Good Friday morning. Jesus was turned over to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, and they were bringing false accusations against Jesus. And Pilate kept asking Jesus, are you a king? Uh, and Jesus said, you say I am. And Pilate interrogated Jesus and they kept saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. This man is innocent. But they kept crying, crucify him, crucify him. And finally Pilate took a basin of water and he washed his hands. And he said, I wash my hands of this whole thing. Pilate could not wash his hands. Pilate caved in to the demands of the people. He was the one who sentenced Jesus to death on the cross. Yes, sometimes I think you and I are like Pilate. We still have that saying, don't we? I wash my hands of this whole thing. If we don't want to participate in something that we think is a, maybe a little shady or we don't want any part of it, will say, I wash my hands of the whole thing. Well, washing our hands doesn't cleanse us from our deepest needs. Simply washing our hands will not cleanse us from our sin. Washing our hands will not cleanse us from our evil thoughts. Washing our hands does not cleanse us from harsh and hurtful words. Sometimes we're very much like Pilate. Or maybe like the disciples who are arguing on this very night, on this Passover night, who was the greatest. Too often times we also want recognition rather than to serve. We want to have honor and glory. Sometimes we're like the scribes and Pharisees who accuse Jesus of not washing his hands. Sometimes we're more concerned about the externals, how we look compared to really just serving as the Lord asks us to serve our neighbor. I've always liked the description in the book of Acts of those early Christians when they gathered for worship. We're told in the book of Acts that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, which was the teaching of Christ, in the fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. The very things that Jesus was doing with his family, with his disciples, on this Monday, Thursday night. He taught the, people, the disciples, he was teaching them there in the upper room. Four whole chapters of John here are devoted to Jesus teaching his disciples on this last night that he was with them. And then they fellowshiped together. They were there for the Passover meal. And then he continued in the breaking of bread. In fact, he instituted the Lord's Supper on that very night as they were celebrating Passover. And they continued together in prayer as Jesus prayed for them at the end of this conversation that high priestly prayer. He prayed for himself, he prayed for his disciples, that they would not fall, and he prayed for the whole world. Jesus, the suffering servant. Jesus, who taught his disciples, who fellowship, who instituted the Lord's Supper. You and I these days are not able to partake of the Lord's Supper. I don't know about you, but I miss it terribly, being able to receive the body and blood of my Savior for the forgiveness of my sins. But I think I've been emphasizing more and thinking more about my own baptism. And I would encourage you also during this, this time of being homebound, socially isolated, think of your baptism. It's kind of fascinating to me that Peter, who cries out here in our scripture lesson, Lord, wash all of me, not just my feet, but my hands and my head, and Jesus does even more than that. He washes Peter, he washed Peter, he washes you and me internally. The Apostle John says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. This same Apostle Peter, who tried to uh, keep the Lord from washing his feet, later on in his first letter he wrote these words. He says, baptism now saves you, not by the removal of dirt from the body, but by the pledge of a good conscience toward God. Not a mere ceremonial washing, not a washing of dirt from the body, 
but rather baptism now saves you. It could hardly be said any more clearly. And so grab hold of your baptism, people of God. It reminds you of your true identity. In the midst of everything that's going on in this world, you are a beloved child of God, washed in the water, cleansed of all your sins, washed internally, externally, completely, all sins forgiven. You have been cleansed by the servant, by your Savior Jesus, the one who came not to be served, but rather to serve and to give his life as a ransom for all. And now he calls you and me to serve. We have been served to the highest extent, the greatest extent. Our Lord went all the way to the cross so that you and I might have forgiveness and life. And now he asks us to serve. In fact, that's what he told his disciples. If I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also need to wash the feet of each other. And certainly during this time of this worldwide pa pandemic, you and I have opportunities to serve others, to be that servant that Jesus calls you and me to be. You can serve within your family as you help each other during this time. You can try to serve each other by being patient in some difficult circumstances. The Lord calls each of us to be servants. Dwight L. Moody, the great 19th century evangelist, once said, the measure of a man is not how many servants he has, but how many men he serves. That's the measure of a servant. Our great God and Savior shocked his disciples on that Passover evening when he took a basin with water and a towel, washed their feet. He continues to serve us. He serves us with the word and the means of grace. He comes to us in every situation in life. And he assures us that he is among us still as a servant. He is there to serve us in our fears, to serve us in those times of high anxiety. He's there with us always as he promises. He has served us to the point of sacrificing himself for you and me. And now he calls us to serve our neighbor. May God grant that for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now may that peace of God, which surpasses all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. On this holy night, in which our Lord gathered his disciples in the upper room, we come to you, O Lord, in his name, with the concerns of our hearts for ourselves and all people. Grant to us zeal for your house, O Lord, and love for the things of your kingdom, that your church may enjoy harmony and peace and confess your word with one voice before the world. Cover us with the blood of Christ and grant us your spirit that we may walk in your ways and do the good you desire. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, Give to us faithful pastors who will preach your word in season and out, and give us ears and hearts willing to hear and heed your voice. Raise up godly men to serve us as pastors, and raise up godly men and women to serve as teachers and in other offices for your service. Bless those preparing for full-time church work in our colleges and seminaries, as well as those considering church work careers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Deliver us, O Lord, from temptation, and lead us to know and do what is holy and right according to your word and commands. Bless those preparing for baptism and those being catechized into the faith, that they would be steadfast in faith in Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the midst of enemies that threaten and a world filled with conflict, give to us wise leaders, O Lord, that we may be preserved from harm, Guide those who make and administer our laws and give to all judges and magistrates knowledge to render justice with mercy. Bless the members of the armed forces who defend us here and abroad. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve the sick, relieve the suffering, and grant to the dying your peace, O Lord. Hear us on behalf of all those who have asked us to pray and those we name in our hearts now. 
Give them healing in accordance with your will, strength to bear up under the burdens of this mortal life, and comfort and hope in trial. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As generously as you have given to us, O Lord, teach us to be generous in giving, that the poor may not suffer want, nor your church be deprived of the resources to serve your purpose, both here and across the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You know, O Lord, what we need, and you have promised never to abandon us. Help us to endure in faith and with a joyful countenance receive the blessings of your grace and the answers to our prayers. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Thursday morning, say your teacher, faithful friend, thoughts of self and safety scorning, knowing how the day would end. Lamb of God, foretold for ages, now at last the hour had come. When but one could pay sin's wages, you assume their dreadful sum. Ever so alone and lonely, longing with tormented heart to be with your dear ones only. For a quiet hour apart, sinless lamb and fallen creature, one last pastoral lamb to meet, one last lesson as their teacher, washing your disciples' feet. What was there that you could give them that would never be outspent? What, what great, great gift that would outlive them? What last will and testament? Show me and the world you love me. Know me as the Lamb of to this in remembrance of me, eat this body, drink this blood. What if faith in love united, all one body, you the head, when we meet 
by you invited, you are with us as you said, one with you and one another, in a unity sublime. 